Well, good evening. I'm Mike Culver. I'm the director here at the Wright Museum. And on behalf of the board of directors, uh, we want to welcome you to the fifth program in this year's 2021 Ron Good Game and Donna Canny uh, Education Series. Um, actually, we have uh, Ann Blodgett. Ann, do you want to stand up? Ann is the... Do I Ann ask her on Well, you don't have to. Uh, yeah. Ann, is, uh, Ann is the president of the board of directors and my boss, so... I'm telling her to stand up. So. <laughs> I do whatever Mike does. <laughs> um, as always, we want to thank Ron and, and Donna for making these programs possible for the past five years. Uh, their support enables us to bring uh, great speakers uh, like Dr. Logan in uh, to speak about a subject that we really haven't, at least in the eight years I've been here, uh, have never talked about much, and that's accurate. Uh, now, don't forget that next week, um, next Tuesday, June the 8th, is a program by Dr. C. Paul Vincent, and that's called The Collapse of the Nazi, Nazi Concentration Camp System, which is going to be very, very interesting. So if you get a chance to come see that, please do that. Be sure to make a reservation. Tonight's speaker is uh, Dr. Richard J. Lobin, Jr., who will present a wide-ranging discussion on how Africa was affected by World War II followed by what I think is going to be interesting in an explanation and of the unintended consequences of the war on African nationalism and independence. Uh, Richard earned his PhD at Northwestern. He's a professor emeritus of anthropology and African studies at Rhode Island College. He's taught at many national and international universities. He's now adjunct professor of African studies at the Naval War College. He serves as the executive director of the Sudan Studies Association. You founded that, correct? Yep. Yes. And as a subject matter expert, um, he often serves as an expert witness um, uh, for asylum cases for African refugees. As an archaeologist, he's excavating a, a temple in the eastern Sudan. And uh, he's an active beekeeper and a devoted collector of historic maps of Florida. There's a surprise, or Africa, there's a surprise. He's written numerous books, and if you go on, on Amazon and look down, you'll see the subjects of Cape Verde, uh, the Sudan, slavery, women in the Middle East, and ancient and medieval Africa. So uh, you're going to have a very knowledgeable person tonight to speak, and of course he will answer questions for about 30 minutes after uh, his presentation. So please, uh, well, welcome, Dr. Richard Logan. Well, good evening to everybody, and I'd like to also acknowledge my wife and daughter uh, and my neighbor, Tim Olroy, who came over here from Bridgewater. We're not too far away. And I uh, thank all of you for, for attending. This is a little bit different kind of program uh, because I think you're much more accustomed to war in the Pacific or uh, war in Europe. Uh, but I, I think I'll make a strong argument that the war in North Africa uh, made those other wars uh, possible. And even the Pacific War uh, has its manifestations in Africa. I was thinking of Japanese submarines off of Africa. And of course, the uh, famous Rommel was finally defeated uh, in, uh, in Tunisia. And that let uh, our troops, the Allied troops, English, uh, French, and, and American troops enter Italy and undermine the, the rest of the Nazi empire. So thank you all for coming, uh, especially since we're getting out of the uh, novel coronavirus uh, 2019 and great to head back to normal. <laughs> and uh, even though you're socially distanced, we're all friendly here, so we can have lots of time for questions afterwards. And thank you especially for uh, Michael uh, for inviting me back or uh, postponing for a year. Uh, so I was about to give this talk last year, uh, COVID struck and and here we are a year later. Um, and he's, of course, the director, as he's announced. So um, first of all, a little bit of context. Uh, US ties to Africa are really old. I mean, even, even when we were still English, of course, we had English-American ties to Africa through the slave trade. And ditto you know, for the American ties to Africa through the slave trade. But the first nation to recognize the independence of the US was actually Morocco. Uh, so that's uh, pretty interesting. England was pretty reluctant to do that. <laughs> and the first nation 
that were attacked by U.S. warships was in Africa. Uh, interestingly enough, these two countries, Morocco and, and uh, Libya, Tripoli, the battle of the Republic source of Tripoli, um, were in, in Africa once again. So it's kind of remarkable that we neglect Africa when it has a primordial relationship to our military uh, presence. And of course, this was the Battle of Dern. Uh, we were recently there fighting ISIS in, in Dern and, and in uh, Sirte and other places in Libya. So it's kind of remarkable that we have to think about this. It's also remarkable because the pre-war context in Africa was a colonial context. After the Berlin Congress of 1884, 1885, when European powers uh, met in, in, uh, in Germany, in Berlin, they divided up Africa uh, for European interests. Africans weren't even serving drinks to the, uh, to the German cha chancellor. And the history, it was a pretty sad one. It was a pretty exploitative history of political repression, divide and rule taxation, and especially from the military point of view, wars of pacification. So Africans did have a lot of experience with war, but it was on the wrong end of the guns. Uh, and we'll see when they're on the right end of the gun, uh, the implications, as Michael mentioned, are pretty, uh, pretty incredible. Uh, from an African point of view, colonialism was really already fascism because it was non-consultative, non-democratic, and, and brutal and racist as well. Uh, so the, the colonial borders, I mean, this is modern-day map of Africa, but almost all those borders, with a few small exceptions, like South Sudan and Eritrea and so forth, uh, they are the uh, borders uh, drawn by the colonial powers back in 1884 and 85. So it's not surprising when the Axis powers come along, to get to the main theme of the evening, uh, that they had their own ambitions for uh, occupation of Africa. Indeed, for the Italians, the, the Roman Empire stretched across North Africa, uh, the Greek Empire even before that, so Libya had been a Greek colony even before that, and so Mussolini certainly had ambitions to restore the Roman Empire and expand it. So he managed to take, try to take Ethiopia, failed the Battle of Ottawa, but did occupy Eritrea in the Horn of Africa uh, for, uh, you know, for decades. And so when they were allied with the Germans, of course the Germans, as hosts of the original Berlin Congress in Germany, uh, they had their own uh, African empire, Cameroon, Tanganyika, Southwest Africa, and Togo. So uh, they were not the first, first time to come to Africa, and so that's why the historical lens really is required as they were, had their own political ambitions to the resurrection or creation of a new empire. Uh, so Hitler had his own uh, interests, similar to some of your posters, I think, this type of uh, motif. And uh, there you can see the German uh, ambitions for Togo, Cameroon, uh, Tanganyika, now Tanzania, and Southwest Africa or Namibia. So uh, when the comes to our turn in the American side of it, our ambition was, of course, to defeat the Axis powers. But in the heartland of the Axis powers in Germany and in the European theater, of course, that was going to be really hard because they had so many impregnable lines. And so attack, uh, tactically, to weaken the German presence, attack in their most remote places and then weaken them uh, there. So the African front, which I've highlighted in yellow, uh, consists especially from the American point of view of Operation uh, Torch, where uh, General Patton was active and so were a lot of other famous generals. And then on the other side of Northeast Africa in Egypt, uh, Montgomery, the, the uh, English uh, general, was advancing through the uh, western desert of, of, uh, of Egypt with the intention that they would finally meet with many reversals, I must admit. Uh, and Rommel, their chief opponent, the uh, Italians weren't quite so successful. And then finally, uh, Operation Husky, uh, after they had routed the Italians and the Germans, uh, then they could invade uh, Sicily. So that's the bookends of what we're talking about uh, tonight. And we'll be skipping the European front because it was the African front which allowed the European front basically to open up. And needless to say, the Pacific front 
uh, did have some relationship, especially with Japanese, trying to uh, make a submarine port in uh, Diego Garcia and in Tenerife, Malagasy. So, uh, from a naval point of view, and although I'm a contractor for the U.S. Navy, I'm speaking just for myself, so don't blame the Navy or U.S. government or DOD <laughs> or anything that I say, just blame me. Uh, but from a naval point of view, uh, Africa had at least uh, half a dozen major choke points uh, for naval strategy. The choke points are critical because these are places where uh, it's going to be highly contested for sh shipment of troops and materials for the, for the war effort. So on one hand, we have the Gibraltar Straits and that narrow corridor between Spain and Morocco. Uh, we have the Suez Canal already established by uh, Empress Eugenie in 1860s, and that was very strategic. Indeed, Rommel wanted to take Egypt and take the Suez Canal to uh, take it out of uh, out of English hands. The Bab al Mandab, simply the other end of the Red Sea. Uh, also, you can see Yemen from Eritrea, or vice versa. Uh, so that was also a, a critical point. In the Horn of Africa, it's quite clear it's a strategic point because of piracy, which mostly has been suppressed in the Horn of Africa now, but does exist elsewhere. The Cape Verde region, that's across from Senegal in the Atlantic part of West Africa. And Southern Africa, uh, of course, is the, the only way you can get around a pretty large continent to, to get around. And the Mozambique Channel up from South Africa up the East Coast. So all these were uh, critical military choke points. They still are, as a matter of fact, in modern day uh, naval uh, planning relative to Africa, and I can prove that by some of the slides. So here is uh, Africa on the right hand side, and look at the number of sinkings off of Cape Verde. Uh, actually, uh, almost uh, more congested uh, there than in, in the North Atlantic, which everybody is familiar with, been watching the latest films on PBS about uh, crossing the North Sea and so forth. Uh, look at all these uh, uh, sinkings, particularly of, uh, uh, of uh, German sinking Allied uh, ships and, and vice versa. It's pretty highly contested. Uh, and in this case, um, more sea battles off of Liberia and British West Africa, so all these little red dots. So Liberia, which was already independent in Africa, was at, at risk of losing its independence had the Nazis uh, or Japanese been able to take over. And it was the shortest, best way to get from northern South America to Africa, where we were going to get colonial troops. That's a key factor of this lecture as well, that the colonial troops are going to be the cannon fodder or the, or the, you know, the fighting force, uh, because Europeans were very much diverted, of course, in, in Europe. In the case of the Graf Speed, one of the uh, major battleships of the uh, of the German Navy, uh, you can see all the uh, ships that were sunk between uh, northeastern Brazil, which is a very African part of, of, of Brazil, as a matter of fact, and the South Atlantic. South Atlantic used to be called in early maps uh, the Ethiopian Sea until we figured that was too Ethiopian, and we would call it the Atlantic instead. So once again, I think I've demonstrated uh, with these slides, and maybe one or two more, uh, look at the Mozambique Channel, how many ships, uh, 163 just in the course of wo World War uh, II were sunk on the Mozambique Channel, now very strategic because of major oil and gas resources. And so who do we have there now? ISIS and Shabab in, in northern Mozambique, also trying to seize the oil. So Africa often neglected, I can say that professionally for 50 years of doing African studies, uh, but uh, the military people, both the pros and the cons, had not neglected Africa, that's for sure. Uh, <clears throat> now, later on, the North Atlantic became much more important, but the, uh, West Africa still was very, very important, particularly around Liberia, which was the uh, jumping off place from, well, even when FDR, for example, had a secret, uh, secret trip, he, took his train out of D.C. and went down to Florida and then some flying and some boating and, and went to Liberia and then worked his way up to Morocco to meet other allies. So uh, this was pretty darn important. 
Now, I think probably everybody's heard about the film Casablanca, <laughs> and uh, it was shot as a propaganda piece in '42, uh, just basically weeks after to as a popular mobilization uh, for supporting the war effort and showing the complexities of uh, particularly trying to deal with the Vichy government. In other words, French people who were maybe pretty keen not to have Germans telling them what to do, but then they had the collaborationist government in the Vichy capital of France. And of course, uh, Rick's Cafe was very important. And I had the privilege of sailing into Casablanca uh, maybe two years ago, and of course I was a lecturer on a cruise ship. And so I was watching uh, the film Casablanca, highly recommended to get a sort of popular view of the nuances and complexities and, and ambiguities, indeed, of, uh, of World War II in that particular part of the mm -hmm. world. So this is what I was saying before. The South Atlantic routes <coughs> avoided the North Atlantic routes, which were so treacherous. Uh, how many uh, tens of thousands of American and, and English merchant mariners lost their lives uh, with wolf packs? on North Atlantic, and so that's why the coming across through Brazil was actually very much more important, remembering the, the overarching theme here, that until uh, the battles in Africa could be consummated and successful, it wouldn't be possible to really engage up the Italian peninsula and finally enter the uh, German heartland. Uh, so here is the, uh, the other part of the story. Um, that it wasn't certainly the intention of the European powers, the former colonial ones or even the ongoing colonial ones, to teach Africans about nationalism, but let's face it, that's what this was largely all about. And it wasn't their intention to teach the military skills. And you can notice that when the war ended, let's say 45, by 19, well, 49, not only a few years later, India was free because they used to have many Indian troops, and they also learned about nationalism. They also learned about military skills. Egypt was independent in 52. Ethiopia just had the emperor restored to the, to the throne. Liberia re regained its autonomy. And then in 56, Libya, Sudan got its independence. And then, of course, in, by 1960s, following the same theme uh, of Africans now wanting their own national sovereignty, having supported and witnessed the Europeans regaining theirs, and now having military skills. And you notice that in the 60s, uh, the vast majority of African governments often got toppled by military coups because that was the, how, how the colonialists arrived in the first place. So they knew all about how to um, commandeer a popular, uh, a popular uh, interest. Half, half of the Free French Army was Muslim. Uh, so uh, let's see. We have a few problems with Muslims in France today, or a few problems between French and Muslim, or Muslim and French, depending upon which way you think the problem exists. But that's nothing new. Half of them were a Muslim. Uh, when the Italians seized Libya from the Ottomans, then of course Mussolini had been already trying to reconstruct the ancient <laughs> Uh, Roman Empire in North Africa. Uh, almost 1.4 million Africans fought for the European powers who were simultaneously the colonial powers, so it's a bit hypocritical or schizophrenic as the case may be, but they're fighting for freedom that they didn't themselves have, so political freedom. So this gives you a little bit of an idea about that. And this was throughout the continent, especially uh, well, there was no part of colonial Africa that didn't really uh, recruit Africans um, for their militaries. So, <clears throat> this is a pretty dense slide, and I'll just focus on a few of the main points, because there were so many operations, major, short-term, long-term, sustained military operations in North Africa by the Allies against uh, the Axis powers. Uh, the one that will uh, be mostly talking about of course, will be Operation uh, Torch uh, coming along, and the uh, sort of relief of the Italians. Uh, you know, there's sort of a sad joke about Italian war surplus. Uh, weapons were only dropped once and never fired. Uh, one of the reasons is that 
um, the Italian recruits didn't want to support fascism, uh, and they were so they were very poorly motivated. And we have a kind of ethno, uh, you know, joke about about that. Uh, and of course, we have the very fascinating tale uh, in New Hampshire about the Germans who were uh, put up in Berlin, New Hampshire, uh, for the prisoner of war camp, and that's a whole other story. But part of the part of this case, and some of those Germans were either gay or communists or who knows what, and they weren't much motivated to fight for Hitler either, so they were glad to surrender and go cut wood in New Hampshire during the course of the war. <laughs> so this just gives you an inventory. There's Operation Torch, which was the main uh, focus uh, we'll, we'll come across to uh, North Africa. Uh, here's French uh, uh, terriers, and of course many were captured because they weren't too keen to die for the colonial, colonial power. But certainly, you don't think about uh, you know all the war movies. You know, maybe uh, a little bit for the um, uh, for the retreat of the English. There were a few cases of African and Indian uh, troops that were sort of neglected. So, the footnote uh, to this uh, for those who recently saw the film about the uh, FDR relationship with the uh, princess of Norway uh, and one scene in that film which I recommend I think it's going to be available on PBS one scene was some Germans who were um, smuggled ashore in several different places including New England uh, to become saboteurs and assassins uh, they were actually rounded up and uh, they were uh, executed in an electric chair they built just for the purpose down in Washington, D.C. So there's another little flashback to, uh, to the war right here in northeastern uh, U.S. Okay, Operation Torch. Well, you can see on the far left um, we have uh, Morocco, a sort of sovereign, uh, well, you've seen Casablanca film, so they were for themselves and occupied by Vichy, uh, close to sort of quasi-fascist uh, Spain and Portugal, so they were in a very vulnerable and a problematic situation. But from this particular period, 8th to the 12th of November of 1942, uh, Operation Torch unfolded as the American and to some extent French allied effort to push towards, uh, well first to Morocco, and then on to uh, Algeria and finally into Tunisia. Some places the battles were very harsh, some places uh, kind of a walkover, but in Kasserin in western Tunisia, uh, the battle was very intense with the uh, highly entrenched and highly <coughs> disciplined forces of Rommel. Meanwhile, on the other side of Africa and Egypt, Monti is coming across, uh, and, but in a lot of this back and forth push and, push and pull, especially the uh, main battles in uh, in Al, Al Alamein and in Tobruk, which changed hands repeatedly. Very similar if you followed the events in Libya during the fall of Gaddafi, a lot of back and forth because there were no mountain ranges or rivers <coughs> or something to give you a you know tactical advantage. So there was a lot of back and forth uh, in that respect. Uh, um, so this is a little bit of a uh, resume of of, of that. Uh, you know, as the um, as Operation Torch was uh, unfolding, and there's our uh, friend uh, Eisenhower, uh, who um, was uh, making his headquarters in multiple places as the as the battlefield advanced, uh, and not in Europe at the time, but certainly uh, in in North Africa. So many intriguing stories that I was, wouldn't have time for, but if you look at Eisenhower and Patton in in the Maghreb. During this particular period of 1942, you will find them very engaging in political, uh, you know, dramas and so forth. Uh, so, uh, another local story is that the USS Massachusetts—I believe that's a nearby state, if I'm not mistaken—it <laughs> um, was uh, put together and is still sitting there down in Fall River. And the first time it uh, fired its uh, big shells was in Africa, like our, like our history from the 18th century and early 19th century. And of course they were uh, heavily involved with the naval uh, bombardment of, uh, of the strategic towns 
uh, in, in, uh, in Morocco. So that's something you can go down there and see. Uh, and remembering it was tied to Africa. But certainly one of the most, um, well, uh, provocative and celebrated or angry or however you want to think about Patton, uh, he was involved in, of course, in Operation Torch and very pugnacious and frustrated and annoying to everybody, uh, but a brilliant, uh, you know, military, uh, military uh, general. Famous especially for the Battle of Kasserine Pass, which was the decisive ally uh, battle. Uh, we used to live in Tunisia, and of course we visited the cemeteries that are filled up with American casualties, well, all across North Africa for that matter. So uh, then uh, he, he was of course still very much in charge in Operation Husky, which is the other bookend of the operations of North Africa. Torch started it, Husky terminated it essentially with some other uh, other uh, cases. So uh, this is the Battle of Kasserine. Uh, the terrain was very difficult. Germans were very entrenched, very desperate, and uh, uh, American and uh, and African casualties were horrendous uh, in the Kasserine Pass, uh, you know, battles. Here's uh, from our neighborhood in Carthage, uh, the American cemetery uh, in Tunisia. Uh, almost 3,000 dead right there alone, and then that's overlooking all the other previous battles across an Operation Torch and the ones in Libya and, uh, and uh, Western uh, Egypt. Uh, so, uh, to give you some little flavor of, of Patton, he was quite an ordinary, ordinary per person, and even his death uh, actually just months basically after the World War II, it still remains controversial. Uh, some people say it was just a normal car accident, some people say it wasn't much of an accident, and who knows exactly what. Uh, I don't pretend to have the answer on that, but uh, he was uh, very effective and very controversial, as you can see by these uh, uh, quotes. But many uh, four-letter words seem to be required when he uh, was working with uh, by the American soldiers. But the other part of the team, the enemy, Rommel, Erwin Rommel, and Monty, after many changes of power uh, of the leadership, military leadership in Egypt, the English finally settled on Montgomery. Uh, when I was stuck in uh, Cairo during the revolution, I was in the hotel where he used to stay, so I had the privilege of uh, lying down in Montgomery, not to mention Churchill's bed and Eisenhower's bed, all these other guys, so I never was lying down in Rommel's bed, however, so that's another issue. So they're coming from the east, and uh, the Operation Torch coming from the west, with the goal in between. Uh, Rommel's Africa Corps, uh, if you have World War II films, you'll often see some of the battles uh, for, um, uh, for Tobruk and El Alamein, as, as I say, a lot of give and take and back and forth changing hands between Allied and Axis powers as the, uh, especially armor and air power was deployed to uh, finally, um, you know, take over this, this area. Um, so his Africa Corps, of course, was, uh, you know, quite uh, formidable. Uh, and a bit earlier in the year that I was born, I'm a war baby myself, uh, uh, he finally surrendered and um, and then it was going to be open season for going up on Operation Husky to, to Sicily. Another little footnote, uh, in case you're treasure hunters, uh, there was an old 4th century BC Jewish community had, which had uh, hoarded gold apparently. Rommel sees that from uh, this synagogue which still exists in uh, Tunisia and was uh, sent to Europe. But ship sank, so if you can figure out if that was true and find the ship, hey, there's your big chance. We have another story coming up on that with the Japanese ship. Uh, even if you go to Europe, uh, there's the Bir Hakim Bridge or the Bir Hakim Metro Stop in Paris. Of course, this is named for Bir Hakim uh, Battle in, uh, in uh, Libya. There you can see it. And at this particular point, it was under British control. But then the Nazis came and knocked off the British and, you know, back and forth in that respect. Um, so this is uh, that, that classic battle. 
but while the uh, Germans finally did uh, defeat uh, the English force there, uh, it did um, slow them down so much that they lost uh, tactical advantage and there probably was an element, maybe not the element, an element for his later, his later failures uh, in defending uh, um, Tunisia. Uh, once again, the Free French uh, and their African allies, uh, they were very much part of the picture. And it has become somewhat of a political controversy in, in France because they say, well, we want our pension. And so the French have been delaying, uh, hoping that mostly they die and they won't be the recipients. But they said, look, we fought and died for France and for uh, other, uh, you know, England, and we'd like to have our military pension. And so that's an ongoing, uh, still unresolved political issue that, uh, in contemporary world. So this is uh, the Tobruk case. I think you can see also some popular films about Tobruk because it was very violent and many clashes and many examples of bravery. Uh, you know, with the, the Dirty Dozen and the, you know, the bad boys of the Africa Corps and all kinds of things that were going back and forth there. Um, so this was the turning point, I would say, uh, because the Germans got closest to the Suez Canal, closest to defeating the English, but out of pretty much desperation and lots of mines, uh, the British held, uh, Germans came back, the British held, and then finally the Germans were forced back from Egypt, where El Alamein is located, and forced back to Libya, and then forced finally out of, of uh, Tunisia. So this gives you some idea of how this went, you know, went back and forth with the various red and blue lines. Uh, it's like a, a football match where you can see the, the, the offense and the defense uh, highly engaged, and that was uh, the critical part that saved the Suez, that saved the choke, that military choke point. So the English troops could use the Suez to get to their other allies in, in subcontinent of Asia, to India in particular, and, and other parts of Arabia. So this is just a kind of popular version of the Tobruk uh, detritus of war. And then this is El uh Of course, uh, not so many Americans. There were Americans there, but it's heavily a cemetery of uh, British, Italian, and uh, Germans. And there's still place, no, no go places uh, with unexploded mines and shells that, that I, it's not advised that you go into the uh, desert area of Egypt in the Western Desert. So uh, we have also this very interesting footnote of Catch-22, a uh, famous, famous uh, popular novel. It's all in this uh, context where Bussarian was uh, finding war pretty much absurd and ridiculous, which probably is pretty close to, right, how normal human beings can be rendered into destroy each other. And uh, anyway, that's another topic, isn't it? Anyway, um, this was uh, quite a, an interesting story where he was dealing with the absurdity of war. And certainly, if you haven't seen Casablanca after seeing that, you can read Catch-22. But another fascinating story is Operation Mincemeat. I just had a little poll. How many people have heard of Operation Mincemeat? Uh, well, three. So that's not too many. And this was one of the classic cases in World War II of deception. Uh, the English, uh, being clever like they, they are, I'm Scottish, so I can say that. Um, and uh, they, they came up with a ruse that was so incredible that it was destined to fail, except that it worked. Um, and the idea was that they were going to plant the idea in German military intelligence that the, um, that the, uh, that the uh, Americans and, and English would invade Europe, not through Sicily, but through the Balkans and through Greece. Uh, and so the Germans would send their troops to reinforce their enlightened the uh, military, the Axis military presence in Sicily. So what did they do? They created, they found a dead person uh, who died of pneumonia, which is somehow looking, from an <coughs> autopsy point of view, looking like he drowned. It's pretty, pretty bad shape. 
but they dressed him up as a military courier for the English and then put him in a tube, as you can imagine, a dead person in a submarine, not so nice. They put him in a tube and when they got really close to Spain, uh, which was sympathetic with Nazis but scared to that they might lose, good smart, smart move of Franco, I guess, uh, and they put him off, the, off of the submarine right on shore of Spain, gave it a few propeller thrusts, make sure he get up on the shore with his secret and false messages. And the uh, Spanish fascists found this uh, dead person courier with the ideas that he was going to uh, bring in this message of change in plans, no more Sicily invasion, but it will be the Balkan invasion. And apparently that body and the messages got through uh, the Spanish fascists and then on to the German fascists and they believed it. And so they did reallocate some of their troop strength to where the invasion would not take place when they uh, did uh, lighten it where the invasion did take place. So here's uh, the dead person, Operation Destiny, <coughs> and there's a popular film, uh, I'm sure that you can show this over here sometime, but the man who never was because it was a fabricated identity. But it was one of the classic cases with pretty uh, substantial impact in the World War II planning, again, from, well, Spain is just across from Africa, so you have to have a little bit of uh, license there. So what we've been leading is the final expulsion of uh, the Germans. Uh, all these battles are over, and uh, now we can get uh, ready to go from Tunis uh, to Sicily, and then uh, up the boot of Italy, and then onward, def defeating uh, Italian fascists on, on the way. Uh, but that would only be part of the story, because there were many other battles going on in Africa. Uh, Italians had their colony in um, Eritrea, and uh, also they briefly uh, controlled um, Ethiopia as well, displacing Emperor Haile Selassie. And they had uh, the uh, larger part of Somaliland, uh, was Italian uh, property, of course, uh, uh, Libya too, but that was, we've already kind of dealt with that. So Sudanese forces were heavily mobilized with the British uh, to defeat um, the Italian presence in Eritrea uh, and in uh, Somaliland, well, Italian Somaliland, British Somaliland, I, I was recently there, uh, it's a little bit more calm than other parts of Somalia. So this is a uh, little bit of that story uh, where some important land battles. I was just up in Karen. I don't know if Karen is on the, uh, yeah, Karen, just where it says Eritrea, uh, filled with Sudanese uh, dead and with Indian dead uh, that had been brought from India to fight for the British against the, against the Italians. So another major area often neglected. Uh, and then this is a very fascinating story because um, you don't think so much of the Japanese being involved in Africa, but they definitely were. Here's Japanese uh, maps and some of their smaller, uh, smaller submarines. They were interested in taking control of uh, parts of uh, Diego Garcia, which is now American intelligence base, uh, and maybe Malagasy. Um, and other places in the Indian Ocean to base their uh, submarines. And so there's going to be some pretty serious uh, battles in northern Madagascar uh, with British uh, Navy uh, making sure that the, um, that the Japanese don't succeed because that would be a commanding height basically from a mixed metaphor of the naval battle but a strategic position if the Japanese could take uh, these particular, uh, uh, Diego Suarez in particular, and Madagascar. <coughs> so that uh, was also contested, and it still is a strategic communications and intelligence center to monitor uh, piracy communications and so forth. So that's a pretty important spot, which is very much unknown. Uh, okay, well, uh, this was, of course, the main. Uh, objective to, to break through the Gustav line in, in Italy and notice that it's still long before D-Day. 
All these things have taken place before D-Day, and unless you came to this brilliant lecture tonight, you would say, well, Africa had no role. And you can see that all, all this chess game of military uh, power uh, had a, a key and critical role for long historical times with many other unforeseen circumstances uh, you know, unfolding. Um, but this is a pretty fascinating story because Cape Verde, the Cape Verde Island was a colony of Portugal, um, kind of specialized in Cape Verdean studies. We have a lot of Cape Verdeans in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. And it would get very strategic. The Germans definitely wanted to hold Cape Verde, just like the Japanese wanted to get to the Indian Island places in the Malagasy Republic. So, uh, and Portugal was, you know, waffling. waffling. It was a colonial fascist state itself, uh, but they didn't want to play the pro-Nazi hand because they would lose some of their, like say, bargaining, uh, bargaining power. But it was a strategic spot for sure. Uh, let me show you a few other reasons why. Here's a submarine which almost got sunk, and, it, and they were led to, the Germans were led to believe they lost that submarine off of Cape Verde, basically. And we uh, got it floating and brought it over to uh, the Caribbean, and then it's now in Chicago. <laughs> Just exactly where you would never imagine a captured German submarine to be. It's down after they floated it. And it's, uh, in the I think Field Museum or Navy Pier or something in Chicago. But the other uh, story, which is pretty fascinating and again a remarkable footnote of World War II history in and around Africa, is the case of U-505. Um, uh, you know that was loaded. It was a, a, a cargo submarine. I mean they had torpedoes too, but it was a gigantic submarine, Japanese Navy, and they were you know in poor or less desperate effort to reinforce and supply the Germans. Look what they had in the cargo. 9.8 uh, tons of molybdenum, 11 tons of tungsten, gold worth millions of dollars, maybe then and maybe even more nowadays. Opium, for medical purposes please. Uh, tin, raw rubber, all kind of stuff. A crew of uh, almost 100 people. And the US Navy managed to sink that ship. Here, here. Uh, well, this is a picture of it, just west of uh, west of Cape Verde Islands. This is this gigantic uh, submarine, and here is a picture of it uh, by camera in deep waters off of Cape Verde. So another fascinating story uh, that you probably didn't ever hear about because it's in Africa, and who cares about Africa? And Japanese will never notice, and Germans will never notice. Uh, well, they absolutely notice. So there's, it's, uh, it's still sitting right there. So if you want to do some scuba diving around 4,000 feet, um, put on the pole. So this, this is a sort of repeat of the earlier uh, effort after Operation Torch and coming across from Melanie. Then off we go to uh, to, to to the European uh, um, uh, you know, European theater. So bottom line for uh, uh, World War II in North Africa, uh, we're almost up to one million uh, dead and wounded of all, all sides. So a pretty incredible number of casualties, especially with Africa being uh, neglected. And of course, the Free French are heavily going to be um, you know, African, African troops. Uh, so onward, of course, after, uh, this is the, the ultimate end of the story where the Wright Museum more or less picks up um, with the Battle of the Bulge and Germany, Germany uh, surrenders and the war is over. Uh, this uh, the little story for New Hampshire, of course, is Camp Stark, named for live free or die General Stark. Uh, and this is up there in Berlin, now called Berlin. No, it was called Berlin and now it's called Berlin to make sure that you don't confuse it. <laughs> and uh, this is where German prisoners of war were kept under pretty nice conditions, not because we especially loved them, but we wanted the Germans to look after our American troops, American POWs, so they figured we better do something nice to them, otherwise the Germans are going to be uh, pretty much brutal uh, for the American prisoners. And so 
Uh, so the war finally is over. These are mostly Seabees, mostly African American. Uh, they weren't so much uh, uh, armed, with some important exceptions, uh, like the Tuskegee Airmen and Red, red Tail Flyers and so forth. Uh, African Americans had been in the military since the Revolution, sometimes armed, Black Battalion and so forth. But often they had, you know, um, in the Navy particular, particularly um, details as uh, cooks and laundry men and not so much armed. During um, Pearl Harbor attack, of course, there were some heroic cases of particularly of African Americans. So the war is over and the story should come to an end. Uh, but it doesn't really come to an end because African Americans, of course, they also learned about fighting. They learned about, um, you know, mutual respect and so forth. Nowadays, we're talking quite a lot about the Tulsa, uh, you know, firebombing of a whole, the sort of Wall Street of uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, mostly, uh, how that started, if you may not uh, be aware, was veterans of World War One, not, not World War Two, but World War One. Uh, who were in their you know, khaki uniforms, and they uh, heard about some white mob that was going to come and burn down Tulsa. And they, so they were the law and order American patriots. They tried to uh, stop it. They knew about arms. They tried to stop it. Of course, we know nowadays with more people thinking about Tulsa, uh, that there was a, a pretty much uh, you know, disgrace for American history. So uh, here's some of the uh, uh, the uh, Tuskegee Airmen and then, you know, uh, anti-aircraft battalion. More in Europe, but also somewhat in Africa. In Africa, they had mostly African troops. They didn't, you know, and it was still, until through the uh, Second World War, the segregated the military. So this is another little bit of the calculation, uh, a little bit of the chronology and the losses uh, as the you can see most of the weapons you see in the museum were weapons which were also used in North Africa by the various, uh, you know, belligerents. So that's in that chronology. Now, if we have time, I think we have a little time mm -hmm. left. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, as promised, and I've kind of been surreptitiously sneaking in this other agenda, uh, Africans in the wake of World War II, uh, first of all, even though powers that won, France and, and uh, England, were very much weakened by World War II. And of course, relatively speaking, the U.S. came out as the new hegemonic dominant unipolar <laughs> force. Africans learned the military skills. They learned discipline. They learned organization, modern uh, techniques. And they, of course, they were already anti-colonial because they didn't want to be colonized. And formally, it was just the, the colonized uh, of the colonizers who were occupied by, you know, other Europeans, and they could settle that uh, issue by what we've just been seeing. So the era of colonial exploitation then is ultimately challenged, first by the Europeans challenging one another, but then finally by the armed forces that they required from Africa to, uh, they had the same uh, objective. And as I mentioned before, the uh, decolonization was sort of resurrected uh, in the previously independent countries of Ethiopia and Liberia, but the other countries, uh, especially in North Africa, Libya, Egypt, and Sudan, within the 50s were already, uh, you know, having uh, both military coups, especially, and uh, still have military governments. And Ghana, 58, and then of course so many uh, who had been in the uh, colonial militaries uh, had the same idea. Um, here's another little footnote. The Belgian Congo at the uh, Shinkola uh, uranium mine, that's where uh, the uranium came from for Big Boy that was dropped over Hiroshima. Once again, Africa forgotten, but without uh, the, we could have many long debates about dropping the bomb and, and Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but that was certainly, uh, uh, you know, a critical factor in terminating the war in the Pacific, and again, it has literally an African uh, foundation. Um, and here's some more African Americans uh, having Easter eggs for Hitler. 
uh, and so forth. And you've got some uh, armor that's not too far away from this kind of guy. Uh, but this is, uh, uh, these are the Black Panthers. Of course, later on, the Black Panthers with Huey Newton and all that become a different kind of a domestic issue. So what is that? You can say a line. Uh, in this particular case, uh, this is yours truly, uh, the tall one in the back, because I was also involved in the anti-colonial war, um, in this case against the Portuguese. I, I, I didn't like the colonialism too much, to be honest. And so I was, uh, uh, I walked from uh, Senegal to Guinea Conakry uh, with the guerrillas and, and the team won. Unfortunately, they had some pretty bad governance afterwards. Uh, Cape Verde, they had pretty good governance, actually. So I have, uh, when I was telling the Navy when they said we need someone to teach African studies for the newly formed uh, Africa, AFRICOM, Africa Command, I figured I had the wrong, wrong pedigree. They said, no, this is exactly what we need because you actually know what guerrilla warfare is about. So I said, well, thank you. Um, and I also was in uh, Eritrea. And in this case, picture I took in Eritrea, they were fighting Haile Selassie at the time. Uh, you can see the Bren gun, that's exactly World War II, so continuity from 1945 to 1971. And then here, uh, of course, uh, AKs are still widely uh, automatic. Klashnikov, of course, named for General Klashnikov, of, uh, who recently passed away, and they have a nice monument for Mr. Klashnikov in Moscow. And I uh, did interview, uh, or someone interviewed me who had interviewed Mr. Klashnikov. He's quite an interesting character, of course, deeply rooted in World War II when the Soviet Union and their satellites made uh, effective, maybe better than some of our weapons, uh, because they had more use of you know, versatility and they had more, uh, uh, you know, could be abused more than some of the American weapons. So uh, World War II is still echoing despite the fact that it's been over for all these years, uh, it's still echoing. And um, on occasion, um, I'm asked to speak about Eritrea, so this is down in Australia. And uh, we find these uh, colonial boundaries are still unfinished business. Uh, so in all these uh, places, uh, civil war in, uh, now it's with ISIS rather than uh, basically fascist kind of outfits masquerading as religious movements. South Sudan, Ethiopia, Cameroon, big clashes going on in Ethiopia, now it is. Cameroon with uh, Amazonia, uh, far from where our daughter was working in the Peace Corps. The Congo, basically a failed state almost from the get-go, and, and in Somalia. Uh, another issue, uh, of course, is uh, here's the coal, uh, which you heard about pulling up in Yemen and having the hole blown in, in its side. Uh, and they put it back together, and so there's a couple of students and myself uh, visiting the, the coal. Uh, of course, the, ten, the link to the World War II is less uh, effective. But anyway, there's uh, World War II. I was in uh, maybe Nowadays, so we're wandering off uh, and a good time to stop. But nowadays, the issues uh, are quite different. Uh, because now we have ISIS and Al-Qaeda and various insurgencies, often motivated for the quest of oil, by the way. And that's what I teach about uh, again in this coming summer for the uh, American and uh, foreign military officers at the War College. So I, I teach about counterinsurgency, counterterrorism. Uh, so there's plenty of things going on. And I think uh, at this game, uh, being boring, I better stop and ask for your questions. And you can tell me what's on your mind. Please.